I am Tanuraj, Chairman, Center for Public Policy Research, and I shall be the host for the evening. Center for Public Policy Research is an independent, not-for-profit public policy think tank dedicated to in-depth research and scientific analysis with the objective of delivering actionable ideas that could transform the society. We started our operations in year 20, 2004 and initiated open dialogue policy changes and institutional transformations in the areas of economy, citizen infrastructure, education, health, livelihood, governance and law, uh, international relations, defense and security studies. Over the years, CPIP has worked with uh, various government institutions, departments, think tanks, academic institutions, universities, and you can find more on our work on our website, www.cppr.in. This occasion, this evening, we are, it's a very momentous occasion for all of us. A research team at CPPR led by Mr. Muralidhar and Nair, senior fellow at CPPR and also a retired Indian consul who had served in many major cities in China, did a comparative study of COVID-19 outbreak response to two administrative divisions of similar status, that is the state of Kerala in India and the province of Hubei in China. The other colleagues of, uh, of my, my other colleagues who joined this support are uh, Ms. Missy, Sol Ms. Missy Solomon, Mr. Madhu Sivaraman and Angela Cecily Joseph. The paper is titled A Comparative Study on COVID Outbreak in the Hubei Province of China and the Indian State of Kerala. The study captured the responses to the coronavirus pandemic from the day it was reported till the day both the entities brought it to zero, even if temporarily, particularly in the case of Kerala. The study has assessed various elements featured in the response systems of the two regions during the above mentioned period. Today, the paper shall be officially released in the presence of chief guest and keynote speaker, Srimadhi K.K. Shailaja teacher, the Honorable Minister for Health, Social Justice and Women and Child Development, Government of Kerala. On this occasion, CPP is also privileged to have a panel, a distinguished panel, to discuss on the topic, responding to COVID-19, reflections and lessons from Kerala, India and China, for which we have luminaries and experts coming from different walks of life, but has got live experience and did a commendable job in containing COVID-19 outbreak in India. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all our esteemed guests, panelists, and participants to this event organized by Center for Public Policy Research. We have uh, Sri Madhi K.K. Shailaja teacher as the keynote speaker. She'll be joining us in a few minutes. Uh, uh, she'll be delivering the keynote and she'll also reflect on the paper. Uh, we already shared the paper with her for her reflections. I don't think we, uh, she requires uh, an introduction. Uh, she is someone who needs no introduction and also he has been her remarkable for her remarkable leadership skills and administrative abilities as a state of state health minister particularly during the outbreak of nipah virus and now during the ongoing crisis caused by covid-19 pandemic shailaja teacher was honored by the united nations on the occasion of united nations public service day so i wait for her to join uh, to officially welcome her to this event we are also joined by Mr. Rajiv Sadanandan, IAS retired as one of the esteemed panelists. Mr. Rajiv Sadanandan is a retired IAS officer from Kerala Cater and healthcare policymaker. He has served as additional chief secretary in charge of the Department of Health and Family Welfare, Government of Kerala. He has been involved with the health systems of the state of Kerala and has been active in health sector reforms of the state. And he has been working and researching in the area of health systems, policy, and financing for over two decades. I welcome you, sir, to this Thank you. Uh, occasion. And it's our privilege to host you here on this panel. We have Dr. Kane Rakhavan, IRS, 
who is also joining on our panel. Dr. Raghavan, India Revenue Service Officer, who is currently Chairman and Executive Director of Rebra Board, Government of India. He had served as Deputy Director, Director of Revenue Intelligence, Kodi Code, CEO of Cooperative Medical College, Kochi, Commissioner of Customs at Kochi, Commissioner of GST and Central Access of Mumbai Central, and CEO of North Our Roots. Dr. Raghavan had also served as First Secretary at the High Commission of India in Singapore. He completed his MPBS from Calicut Medical College and he has written notable books on China and is well versed with the Chinese political and administrative system. Welcome you, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. We have Dr. Ruben Abraham as one of the esteemed panelists with us today. Ruben Abraham is CEO of IDFC Foundation and IDFC Institute, a Mumbai-based think tank focused on state capability and political economy issues. Is a non-resident scholar at the Maroon uh, Institute at New York University and a senior fellow at the Milken Institute in Singapore. In addition, he is a senior advisor to Sisre and an honorary advisor to the New Zealand government at the New Zealand Asia Foundation. He was selected as a young global leader for 2009 by the World Economic Forum, where he currently serves as vice chair of the South Asia Regional Board and on the Global Futures Council on the Future of Cities and Urbanization. Welcome, Ruben. We also have the presence of uh, Mr. P.K. Hormistar again, IPS retired, Mr. Murli Dan Nair, all are part of CPPF family, and uh, I welcome both of them to this uh, discussion. I also extend a hearty welcome to all the participants who have joined us here on Zoom and also all the others who are joining us on Facebook Live. I take this uh, time uh, to thank and congratulate the team of researchers who co-authored this paper. It took a few months to complete this paper. It is a very difficult journey. Uh, I was involved in, uh, in various capacities to see the progress of research work, and I do understand when you compare Kerala with a province like Hubei, the difficulties in getting uh, documents, uh, evidence to prove our research work, uh, it was very difficult. It's my pleasure to uh, request uh, Mr. Muralidharan Nair uh, to give a background of the paper and also the work he and his team handled. Over to you, sir. Honorable Health uh, Minister Srimadhi Shailaja, teacher. Honorable Sri Hormis Saragan, sir. Chairman CPPR, Dr. Dhanraj. Distinguished members on the panel. My young colleagues in CPPR, uh, friends from the media, Ladies and gentlemen, warm greetings from a cold afternoon in Delhi. Uh, I have only 10 minutes uh, at my disposal, so I will not be going deep into uh, any aspect. I will just uh, you know, skip through, run through all these uh, uh, minor points I have with me. Let me begin with some acknowledgements. First, uh, about the title of the, of the paper. Uh, it is the brainchild of Sri Taragan, sir, who asked us whether such a com quick comparative study was possible. That was at the time, uh, both provinces had just brought things under control in the, uh, in, after the initial outbreak. Uh, as uh, Dr. Dhanaraj mentioned, getting information out of China in the normal course is a difficult task. But uh, during the course of the pandemic, there was a blanket uh, ban on information uh, being passed out to outside uh, the country. That's what I say is about China. Uh, uh, and I thank Taragan sir for the continuous support and guidance we, th th this team received all through the past few months. 
and uh, the framework of the uh, study, that is the topics to be covered, was uh, put together by Dr. Dhanraj with his uh, long experience. I am a novice in such exercises. And uh, I did the Chinese part of the study and some analysis on the uh, comparative aspects between the two regions. And my young colleagues, uh, Ms. Uh, Nisi Solomon, uh, Mr. Madhu Shivaraman, and uh, Ms. Angela Joseph at the initial stages, did the work on the Kerala side of it. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Dhanraj and uh, all those people who are associated with the production, including our editors uh, and uh, the printer. Uh, I have very little opportunity to interact, interact with this uh, la last mentioned two, two sets of people. So uh, I would like to congratulate Ms. Nisi Solomon and uh, Madhu Shivaraman on a job well done, according to me. I hope the panelists will uh, be able to give an independent observation about the quality of the paper we have been able to put together. Mm. For Nisi Solomon and Madhu Shivaraman, it was not researching and writing on the Kerala uh, side only. They had to merge work submitted by four or five authors at different times. It was a Herculean task, a difficult task, arduous task. I congratulate them for this uh, hard, for their enthusiasm and sincerity. And I hope they will continue to um, work and update on this paper. And probably they can uh, bring out an up updated edition of the paper sometime maybe after Kerala comes out of this uh, difficult days. Now, I would have liked to highlight a few points discussed in the paper, but the paper is already with the panelists. I think all those who are attending will be getting, I'm told, they will be getting a copy of the, uh, they, it will be available for download on CPPR website. So I don't have the time to go in detail into all the aspects, but it was a very interesting uh, study as we, as we started and as we progressed because we had a communist uh, uh, government in China where as we know, it's a one party system. And we incidentally or coincidentally had a uh, government led by a communist party in Kerala, but democratically elected. So how the uh, procedures uh, differed as far as uh, decision making was con concerned how if, if the uh, fight against COVID was driven by C, uh, the Communist Party of China in Hupei, uh, the Kerala government saw to it that it was people's participation that uh, was the way for us. And uh, one could see the uh, real, ex real meaning of the expression social uh, uh, capital playing out in Kerala. There was differences in the approach to extending help to the vulnerable people uh, in both the places, totally different approaches. If Chinese, uh, if Kerala had, you know, those cash transfers, the famous kits everybody got, and I think they are still continuing to get it. But Chinese never believed in those uh, freebies. They, they gave people, uh, you know, the Chinese practical or pragmatic mind, uh, gave them vouchers and made people pay for whatever they purchased. Uh, and uh, this was redeemed, the vouchers could be redeemed partially uh, during actual purchases. The aim was to, to encourage consumption, uh, which would uh, improve manufacturing. The Chinese thought that if they gave cash to the people, they would be saving up and they would not be spending. So the idea was even on the relief packages announced to various industries, we could see the difference. Uh, the, uh, the, the focus of the Chinese was to 
uh, see that a minimum number of people were laid off. People had the job. Chinese have the, the ultimate aim of keeping the, the community, especially the workers, calm. Uh, they are not worried about students. They definitely are worried about workers getting agitated. So uh, let us see the positive side also. Uh, they, they made sure that even in February, even as none of the provinces was out of um, uh, the pandemic outbreak, they, they issued a, an order uh, on, on the way they have to kickstart the economy, start manufacturing itself. When, when that was the type of vision they had, it, the pragmatism. So I will just uh, go to two points before I finish. Uh, if anyone asked me, what are the two big takeaways for me uh, from the comparative study? As a Malayali, uh, I would say the use of technology was an important thing in China's uh, fight against COVID-19. Uh, they had around um, 20 odd devices and apps of various types they use for collecting information, uh, analyzing it. it. This includes a famous or infamous social credit system whereby they could uh, monitor the activities of uh, all citizens in a GFE. Anyway, they uh, put it to good use. Uh, Whereas we have an aversion, we, I'm, I'm, I don't have to explain uh, about the controversial issue of our government contracting a, a foreign company for analyzing data. Uh, I don't go into the merits or demerits of it, but I feel that this is high time that Kerala also started uh, putting together a database of its citizens. Uh, we have you know, Indians, in general, and Malayalis in particular, have a, a difficulty in sharing our personal information when it comes to sharing it with our government. We have no issues in sharing our information, including biometrics, bank details, information of our relatives, etc., to foreign embassies while we apply for visas. We have no issues sharing our information with uh, mobile phone companies or Wi-Fi companies. But when it comes to government asking for minimum data, this is an issue. But my humble request, I wish the minister was listening, uh, is to start without waiting for another disaster or a catastrophe to strike India or Kerala. Kerala is getting increasingly disaster prone. They would start uh, putting together a database, which can be used not only during disasters, but also for planning social welfare measures and uh, developmental programs. And the final uh, point is uh, you know, on June 7, the Chinese state councils, as you know, state council is their uh, union cabinet, <clears throat> released a white paper on their fight against uh, COVID-19. There it was clearly shown that uh, the Chinese had given Chinese traditional medicine, TCM, that is equivalent to our Ayurveda, uh, to 92% of the confirmed cases. The white paper also says that uh, the use of Chinese traditional medicine helped in uh, preventing mild and moderate cases from turning into critical or severe or critical uh, cases. Uh, they had the pragmatic leadership in China, uh, had used the same traditional medicines during the SARS uh, epidemic in 2003 and also during H1N1 swine flu uh, epidemic in 2009. Uh, there were no um, empirical studies, data collected, trials and all. They went by their uh, traditional wisdom uh, so my point here is that Kerala, <coughs> excuse me, allowed the use of Ayurveda and homeopathy, maybe very late in the day. Uh, so uh, wh what I submit to the government is that <coughs> while our numbers of uh, new infections are still continuing at a <coughs> high rate, we have been able to 
bring down our case uh, uh, our fatality rate the mortality rate to one of the lowest in not only in india but anywhere in in the world so this is a big achievement so without taking away any credit to the allopathic uh, practitioners and the healthcare system in kerala my only point is that probably as it happened in china uh, though the government allowed ayurveda in the treatment of uh, covid only very late people in kerala a good pro proportion of them have been taking uh, ayurvedic medicines and uh, homeo medicines uh, pro prophylactically as prevention to boost immune system or whatever and these medicines are not like uh, uh, allopathic uh, vaccines where you have to conduct trials first stage second stage third trial third stage and all these are medicines which have been in use for decades if not for centuries so uh, government may, my submission is the government may just think about commissioning a study on the use of or the contribution of uh, ayurveda and homeopathy in bringing down our case uh, fatality rate that's a mortality rate if that study proves to be uh, useful i am making this statement not uh, as a malayali who likes ayurveda or homeopathy i have access i have access to the studies done by the covid response cell of the ayurveda wing of kerala also i have seen the studies done by the homeo practitioners in pattanamthitta government practitioners so there is hope i think if the government has difficulty I, at least they can ask the uh, who uh, who have uh, agreed to set up a traditional medicine center in india to undertake such a study as one of its task with this i thank everyone uh, for supporting us uh, in this uh, uh, research work and also for listening to me thank you thank you sir uh, that was a uh, nice uh, start uh, great start to uh, our panel uh, we wait uh, uh, the minister to join but we uh, continue the panel discussion Uh, the discussion is not confined to a paper. It's also about various learnings, understandings, and also the experiences that uh, Kerala, India, and China experience. And also, we have you know, we have a great panel of uh, experts. They would be able to reflect on some of these aspects in the in next sixty uh, minutes. Uh, uh, I'm also told by Ruben that he has another meeting, so he has to leave by six thirty. So I take uh, a few questions straight to him. before i let others to come in and reflect on ruben uh, uh, it's very coincidental that you know my last trip was to meet you i mean the last trip outside kerala was on <laughs> march 12th you know i remember you recall the meeting that we had in your office and you were actually and in fact that's also very coincidental that uh, one of my colleague she she is a co-author to the paper she she was with me that time when we were meeting and you see uh so uh, i remember you know you were telling me the government is not prepared you know what this government is doing you are very very you know very alert I, in fact even though i am also a public policy researcher i was i don't think i was so alert about the the unraveling situation about covid at that time uh ruben could you i mean you are you you are part of covid task force so could you reflect on you know i'm sure you i hope you uh, were able to read through the paper that we are publishing today but adding in addition to the paper uh, could you reflect on the the uh, the the the, the health care you know system that we need to strengthen you know you talked a lot i still remember you talked a lot about the situation in mumbai how many beds we have i think you told me like we have got only 20 beds <laughs> right so i was also a little alarmed next next day i flew back to kochi so you know could you could you share your experience uh, the strategies the experience and how kerala uh, contain it uh, i know that even you don't have the direct experience seeing uh, what kerala is doing uh, but generally there is a very good perception about kerala's covid management and we also reflect on chinese you know uh, reaction response to the covid outbreak could you could you give some insights yeah <clears throat> uh, for, first of all thank you dr dhanaraj for uh, inviting me as a 
as a former Cochin resident, it gives me great pleasure to be part of this panel. <clears throat> um, so just to quickly answer the first part of your question, um, I mean, it really has to do with the fact that we have a few friends who are, um, how shall we call it? Let's call them virus hunters. So they had been alerting us to this for a very long time that something like this could happen. And so <clears throat> we've also been um, reading a bunch of papers from, you know, which were published in 2015, which talked about SARS-like coronaviruses basically propagating in um, uh, horseshoe bat clusters in Yunnan province in China and so on and so forth. So in that sense, we were deeply interested, but I think our antennae really went up after we started a series of conversations with the Taiwanese uh, CDC. So uh, in addition to the Hubei angle to this, I mean, I think the, the part that I would strongly encourage CPPR or anyone to basically think through is just focus a little bit on what Taiwan did and what Vietnam did. I think there's enormous lessons there to be learned and Taiwan in particular is also a democracy. So it's not like uh, you know, th they could do things differently from the way India did things because India is a democracy. So just to quickly um, give you a couple of insights on this, um, when, when Taiwan talks about surveillance, um, sentinel surveillance and so on, their surveillance actually starts from a different place than most of what we would consider surveillance. Their surveillance basically starts with Chinese social media. So they have been constantly surveilling Chinese social media for a very long time. So um, by early December, they had already tracked down the fact that there were these unexplained pneumonia clusters that were emerging in Hubei province. Um, and uh, they didn't really know what was going on there. And by December 20th or thereabouts, the Taiwanese had decided the Chinese would lie about it. And they had basically, uh, they, they, they had come to that conclusion based on their experience with SARS. And, uh, and, and, and when, when you talk to the Vietnamese, it's the same story because it, Vietnamese also assumed that, um, that China would not be forthright about what is going on, especially about human to human transmission. And so by December 30th, the, Ch the Taiwanese had actually got a full-fledged response strategy in place, which they had kicked into effect by the first week of January, which includes quarantining of flights coming in from Wuhan, um, uh, all kinds of things that the Taiwanese actually had put into place by the first week of uh, January. Um, to keep in mind that Kerala was also fairly alert to a lot of these things, so nothing taken away from the way uh, Kerala did things. But I think, I think the Taiwanese and Vietnamese models are really worth looking at. The other thing I think that certainly, and this was my experience uh, with Kerala and from where we took something uh, away from the Kerala experience, which is the way Kerala had tapped into it expatriate network um, and, and the expertise that was sitting outside of Kerala from non-resident Keralaites and so on, which we found to be incredibly interesting. And that was what we went on to then sort of uh, do at the national level and, and available to all states, which was that we set up a task force, but not just of healthcare experts, because our point consistently was that this is going to have massive economic downside, it's going to have law and order implications, it's going to have break the supply chain, all of those. So we actually put together a expert group of people from around the world that were available to you know, help and advise state governments, federal governments, if there was any need for it. Um, uh, Mr. Taragan was actually part of one of the groups uh, and he gave us a lot of very useful advice. And this group eventually grew to about 175 experts globally. And we had about 70 researchers backing the effort. So uh, that's the scale at which we work. We ended up working with about 14 different uh, state governments, uh, uh, the federal government and so on and so forth. But again, you know, it's, it's one of these things where Ultimately, we are an outside agency, right? I mean, why would any government say anything that we are saying, you know, more seriously than necessary, uh, and so on and so forth? But um, I, I think those are the kind of questions that we need to sort of answer going forwards. Which is that if the state does not have capacity within, what is the what are the ways in which the state can actually tap into outside expertise? Um, you know, what is a formal structure that we can sort of create for that? Um, the other thing that we did, um, um, which perhaps most of you have heard about, was we were at the forefront of these seroprevalence studies. So we did a lot of seroprevalence work 
So we were the we were involved in the study that was done in Mumbai that showed that 57% of the uh, slums already had uh, COVID prevalence. Uh, we then repeated the exercise in Karnataka, again showing a fairly high degree of prevalence. And we have just completed a very large zero prevalence study in Tamil Nadu, the results of which should be out in the uh, sort of next uh, few weeks. So this is broadly speaking, the sort of things that we were doing. And right now we are involved in an effort to develop vaccine strategies that are more uh, applicable to the developing world, as opposed to vaccine strategies that are coming out of the West. So I'll, I'll stop here. And if there are additional questions, I can answer it. Sure. Uh, before, you, uh, before I come back to you, Ruben, I have a question to uh, Dr. Raghavan. Uh, you're, you talked about Taiwan and you very particular mentioning that you know it's not an autocratic state uh, or you know it, it's a democratic state. So, uh, uh, Dr. Raghavan, could you give your you know share of your experience looking at Chinese administration uh, and the way they you know uh, try to contain virus or they want to suppress the information, whatever way we could call it, uh, and the crisis also globally has given way to uh, you know government's role is increasing or I would say the bigger government, you know, government size is growing. Uh, that's a debate now. So could you, could you give some insights on, uh, you know, since you, are, you have some insights on uh, Chinese administration and all, uh, you know, how the system worked out there and how that is different from our experience in Kerala? So, uh, let me first congratulate uh, Murli and team for an excellent study. In fact, uh, very insightful, very enlightening. While answering the question, I, I have a small query to pose also to the team. I had, uh, see, one of the problems in tackling China is a lack of information because we have to go by what the state says. And about the society also, we hardly have any literature emerging out of China. Literature is the way in which we get to understand the country, the people, the culture, the practices and all that. So we necessarily have to go by what people who are staying in China, foreigners write about it or or what the state gives out. So I read a couple of books, both written by correspondents of a particular newspaper or station there, had one very interesting point to make, that the bureaucracy and the local political officers or, or members of the party are much more responsive and attuned to the needs of the public than their counterparts in India. I, I was surprised to read it, because one will think that in a, in a single party setup where they don't have to face elections, Maybe there might be elements or, or there might be scope for people not being apathetic or not being as responsive as it would be in a democracy. But one one uh, snippet that was added was that in India, every five years, the elections are there. So that gives a mandate. Whereas in China, it is a day-to-day -day affair. You have to keep on winning the support or, or the uh, keep on have winning the confidence of the people. So it is in this connection that one thing is quite surprising that about the initial cover-up that came in, whether that was done by the officials at the local level, as has been suggested in the report, or whether there is an involvement at the central level also. Because as was suggested even by Ruben in his listening by the, uh, even the Taiwanese who are monitoring the social media, came to know that by December that there were an unprecedented increase or rather a huge number of cases of pneumonia of unknown nature in the Wuhan and in the Hubei province, which certainly should have been investigated. So that did not happen. Well, that is certainly, had it been in a country like India, it would certainly have been done. We can we can proudly say that what happened to the NIPA, the, the other side of it, it was identified and it was managed very well. Maybe the levels of infectivity are lesser, maybe the levels of connectivity are, are, are different, but the point is that had it been in a setup which is responsive, which is transparent, which is open, probably the initial cover-up or rather the initial issue that took place because of which the world got to know the news about the late would not have happened. But otherwise, as was suggested, if you have a straight line system where it's top down, directions are given and the society generally, that's another point which emerges out of the report is that law abiding or, or rather not just law abiding, but abiding the dictates of the government without questioning a society like the Chinese who do that. If you have that, well, it is easier to implement the measures of the lockdown. It is easier to have uh, things like mass testing, central quarantine, probably that th those measures might be easier. 
rather than in a place like this where questions are asked every day but again coming to a point if you feel that the gently uh, at one point it was said that success is survival when it's fighting the covid and this is almost equivalent to a war but you find that history teaches us that invariably democracies are emerge triumphant over autocratic setups in war whether it is a physical war or even the war against the virus so without uh, we should understand that the innate strength of the democracy was what we witnessed in kerala at all levels not just at the uh, level of the government at the uh, top executive at the capital but also down to the local self governing bodies that we saw here whereas in china it was always a top down they have bureaucratic structure they have all the response uh, like you said the level 1 to level 5 there and everything swung into action but that initial or, or the lapses or the delays that took place proved to be critical not just to china but to the entire world so this is a take away that we have to have uh, uh, as to why it happened and it is something that should not happen again so if you when you are comparing these structures i would say that the inner strength and resilience of democracy would have served the world much better rather than a structure that was in existence yet at least in preventing or, or rather reducing the impact of the pandemic that we are all felt that is from my side for now thank you thank you sir uh, i'm sure uh, our research team would respond to you but before that uh, since we are comparing the democracies i have a question to dr rajiv sadanandan uh, rajiv sir you know uh, you've been uh, you know working researching on healthcare systems and public healthcare system for so many decades and one of the findings in this paper is about the decentralized system that we have in kerala and it's also a true reflection of uh, participatory democracy i would even say the deliberative democracy that we are you know we 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 are grateful to that system uh, uh could you could you give some insights uh, it's not only about covid time we also tackled nipa for example and also one of the uh, early learnings that we have in the study was that nipa experience actually helped us uh, to become more vigilant and be prepared uh, could you give some could you throw some light into this uh, uh, decentralization and democratic systems that we have in kerala before that let me respond to a couple of points that uh, dr rakhwan mentioned as someone who has been studying chinese health systems uh, uh, for a long time uh, seeing it transform from the pre deng period over to the disaster uh, in the 90s and how they started changing in the 90s and currently for a uh, for a country uh, that has gone through this kind of changes chinese have an excellent uh, 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 health system I mean, universal coverage is almost uh, 95% and there is no way kerala or any of the, the indian uh, any of the indian states can come by with what is there in china two chinese will always fudge data you know in uh, when during nipa or even before that when we were combating the 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 dengue epidemic of 2017 what i told my people was what happened what china did in 2003 which was hide the sars epidemic and china in hurting themselves so in public health it is always important to be transparent and only then you know can you address it once you understand the whole uh, dimension which is what again i said during nepa we have to be transparent and something if you remember during nepa every day the information would go out and which has been followed in uh, covid also and i think kela demonstrated that uh being transparent is extremely useful third thing is chinese are the masters in public health campaign you know uh, those of you who work in this area would have heard about this christosomiasis uh, campaign this is a disease that is carried by a river snails and what china did was they decided to eliminate this disease so they just diverted the course of the river asked every chinese living on the banks of the river to get physically into the mud pull out the uh, snail the river snails and throw them into the you know in, into the fire of course the next campaign that is the four bucks campaign didn't work that uh, like that so chinese health system is used to running this kind of thing and invariably in such a campaign the uh, party takes over it's it's no longer left to the health system the whole party takes over and what you mentioned about the uh, chinese communist, communist party's performance chinese communist party is not a communist party it's a bureaucracy you don't join it you're selected to it and 
uh, and and your survival is much more difficult than what an indian bureaucrat has you know the uh, performance appraisal their uh, survival is extremely difficult so the pressure to perform is much higher than ours one of the uh, documents we need to compare to understand the chinese and indian experiences uh, professor amartya sen study of the of the comparative response to famines he says that china had you know uh, china had much better infrastructure than what india had in response to a famine but because india had civil society organizations that highlighted this issue out in the end less number of people end up dying in in, in india than they did during a comparable famine in in in, in china so your point about and and i think that point is coming through in uh, in uh, subrila das paper paper also that the uh, civil society uh, involvement transparency and the uh, you know the, the kind of responsive governance made good many of the defects of our system uh, again a very interesting point made but made in this paper which i think is extremely useful which uh, 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 ruben would agree is something that taiwan also did taiwan korea singapore and others also use technology but the advantage they had is that they have universal coverage they have universal health insurance they have excellent surveillance and what taiwan did was to make the data systems talk to each other so that if a person reports with a with a uh, let's say uh, uh, influenza like illness in kerala that doctor would have to pick it up and say, report it to the to uh, report it whereas in in, in uh, taiwan if the uh, <clears throat> doctor writes in his uh, in his electronic health record that the person has an eli ili that is straight away linked to the transport system the transport system says that, okay this gentleman travel from this part of the world and at the back end the artificial intelligence kind of analyzes data and gives uh, something that the policy makers can make use of this is what kerala has been trying to do we have been trying to create electronic health records the e health program is something that we hope would reach there unfortunately it has not moved that to that extent but as and when and it's going to be a long as and when as and when we reach there we will have a comparable technology that at least within the health system can pick up things and generate not only the something like uh, covid uh, what we put in place post nipa was uh, picking up emerging pathogens before they cause an epidemic so the moment you have electronic health records electronic medical records that collate this information and have decision support systems at the back end that can alert the uh, the, the authorities that would be a, a substantial improvement but unfortunately we are nowhere near uh, reaching there to uh, respond to the point that uh, mr dhanraj mentioned kerala's decentralized governance and the civil society systems actually exemplified the point that uh, dr raghavan was mentioning which is the uh, the lack of a of a of a very efficient uh, bureaucracy like what china has the lack of uh, the you know uh, information systems that uh, many of the other southeast asian countries have we make good by our social capital and i mean i mean and i can, i'm i'm very uh, uh, proud of the way the kerala society responded to the pandemic our the impact on our economy was was terrible the uh, amount of hardship it would have cost would have been irreplaceable even now it is hard but the fact that we had a much softer landing than what we actually had the credit should go to the uh, civil society and the decentralized governance system that we have in the state so what we lose in terms of efficiency we make good using social capital i hope that responds to your point mr thanraj thanraj thank you sir thank you sir uh, uh, that's one uh, uh, i i connect uh, uh, ruben uh, with that point that you made just now on the technology use of technology artificial intelligence um uh, and also the decentralized system ruben uh, could you give some insights on because there is also a question to you about dharavi uh, how the, the pandemic was contained uh, there in dharavi and also i read a number of research papers coming from idfc institute about you know the urbanization and connect with the uh, uh, covid uh, and use of technology 
and then now we come to another point about the decentralized system the the strength of the local governments uh, the local municipal corporation for matter uh, what do you what do you think about the you know what are the learnings from this phase and what are the learnings for all of us for the last from last 8 9 months uh, a city like dharav a city like mumbai faced or the state like maharashtra uh, uh, which has which really suffered a lot from this pandemic uh, so techno- is the technology solution is the urbanization the way we urbanize the problem or is the uh, the decent is the institutional strength that is what we need to look at now yeah so uh, dr anuraj i missed the last bit of what you said because there is some disturbance but let me just quickly answer a couple of things that you asked so um, i mean both rajiv as well as uh, murli raised the point about uh increasing use of technology and murli specifically also talked about why are people so suspicious um well i actually think that the suspicion would go down a great deal more if we had really good data governance frameworks in mind so even during the pandemic because we were working with multiple states um you could see for instance that kerala really really cared about data governance and they, they there was all kinds of conversations about how do you protect user data and i mean contrary to what was being reported in the press there was a lot of uh, uh, there was a lot of commentary from within the government about how to protect government uh, uh, user data on the other side i mean i don't want to name states but there were at least two major states in india that were literally taking patient data from arogya uh, arogya setu and basically putting it on a public website which basically included your home address your phone number your latitude longitude and whether you were covid positive or not that was sitting on a public website right if you have that sort of thing happen then you shouldn't I mean, we shouldn't be surprised that people are a little bit suspicious when government asks for the data so i think data governance matters just as much as you know the data framework so the more we say that we want to use technology which i am a huge votary of i think uh, you know this is exactly what taiwan and so on basically did but we need to have the governance of this really in place as well and there's a huge variance that we notice between states when it comes to data governance so that's one the second thing on the china question um so it's one thing for china to suppress data but i think there's another thing to keep in mind which is china's influence on the who is also something that we need to basically keep into take into account because keep in mind even the who as late as mid january was basically saying there is no human to human transmission and while they are saying this you know the taiwans and the vietnamese are basically preparing for this crazy kind of eventuality right um and 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 again at around the same time i think it was jan 20th or so nicholas nasim talib basically wrote a paper in which he basically talib's point was actually let us not treat this as the average epidemic so let, like let's say ebola or whatever but because this is actually occurring in hubei we must be prepared for non linear effects because china is super connected to the world unlike central africa so therefore we are going to see major sort of non linear effects when it comes to this virus so that was again something that was uh, suggested um i think i think on the on the on the on the broader question of federalism local governance i think there's a set of really really interesting questions here that i am not qualified to answer because we see this tension actually emerging in the united states we see it in germany we see it in switzerland and we see it in india which is how do you address a pandemic like this is it better addressed centrally is it better address addressed locally and what are the tensions that emerge as a consequence and we have seen very very different outcomes depending on the country that you are looking at the in general what we have seen so uh, i mean rajiv sadanandan and others probably remember this but i think it was in september october of 2019 uh johns hopkins had put out a an index of epidemic preparedness and if you go back and look at that index of epidemic preparedness is actually quite amusing because the number one country in the list of epidemic preparedness is the united states yeah and we've all seen how well they have basically dealt with covid so again with the benefit of hindsight if i look back and say what are you know what are the areas the regions the countries that have actually dealt reasonably well with covid the one common factor that i've seen and i'm including kerala in this the one common factor that i see is have you had previous experience with an epidemic 
And if you've had previous experience with an epidemic, your response has been fairly good as a kind of consequence. And finally, to your uh, question, um, uh, Danuraj, about and, and to the questions about Dharavi and so on. Um, so I also recall, uh, sorry, Ruben, to inter intervene. Uh, I also recall the op-ed that you had uh, uh, written for Hindustan Times uh, a few months ago with the urbanization and the density yeah. factor and how it played yeah. out. So, uh, probably, you know, participants would like to hear from more from our, uh, you about those issues. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 a couple of things. So, um, <clears throat> on the let, let me just quickly address the Dharavi question first. So, yes, it seems like Dharavi has controlled the epidemic, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but. It, that you see the, the problem is the the zero prevalence data now keep in mind we have not been allowed to do a zero prevalence study in Dharavi, but we've done it in other slums in bombay but if you are saying that there was a 57 percent prevalence already then it does not occur to me like it was actually very successful at containing uh, the illness because it looked like covid has swept through these slums already now for whatever reason we haven't seen the you know, the, the fatality rate go up as a consequence. We haven't seen severe cases of illness. We don't necessarily know why that is, but certainly it would appear like COVID's actually already run through the slums. It's so contrary to, so the success to the point, uh, to the extent that it can be typed as a sort of success story, the success has to be widened. Why didn't we see a much higher fatality rate if the disease actually swept through, right? So I think, I think that's uh, one thing to keep in mind. And finally, on the urban question, look, I, I think a big mistake is being made here by people conflating density and crowding, right? Because a lot of that sort of conversation emerged because New York and London were badly hit. So therefore, uh, you know, cities get uh, are worse hit than, than other places, blah, blah, blah. Now, what this is not considering is, well, Tokyo, uh, Taipei, Hanoi, Auckland are also big urban clusters and they were not hit anywhere near as bad as, as uh, New York or London. So they, clearly there's other explanatory variables at play, at play. And I would argue that the real issue here is not density, the real issue here is crowding. And what I mean by that is a 500 square foot space is not a problem if it's two people sharing that space. But if a 500 square foot space is shared by 20 people, it becomes a huge problem. Right? So we should focus on the crowding question, not on the density question. And the crowding question can only be answered by supply side measures by the government, including things like increasing FSI, because that is how you actually unlock uh, urban land, so, so to speak. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, uh, I, I hope uh, 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 you have time for one more question or uh, yeah, about leave, Ruben. Yeah, I can do one more. One more question. So Ruben, uh, there is also a question about uh, uh, the system of uh, the systems and processes that you know we need to set up. You know? and it's a very general question since you are leaving. Uh, I want to know from you, from your experience, uh, the task force experience, and uh, your you know global experience. What do you suggest to the government? What 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 all systems and processes should be in place now to contain a pandemic like this? Um, so, so again, I, I am I am not an expert on health system, so I will really leave that part of it to to someone like uh, to someone like Rajiv. I think the broader sort of question that we can see at a global level is, you know, so first of all, I think we are entering into a world of tail risk, and not just healthcare risk, but a bunch of other sorts of risks that are emerging. And so, how do we sort of ahead of time start thinking in terms of risk? risk management, and how to respond to it. So a good sort of example of this is the Singapore Prime Minister's office has something called the Center for Strategic Futures, where they are basically scenario planning various possibilities that could happen. And the various possibilities could be H5N1 as, as your disease X, or you could have the Saudi monarchy falling. And you basically have, you, you scenario plan for that. And you have let's say five different outcomes here that are possible and how does the government respond to each of these? Uh, I, I, think, I think that's the sort of thinking that needs to happen through an office of risk management or resilience or whatever you want to call it. I, I think that matters. I think the other thing that matters is, you know, most of these things are going to be multidisciplinary in its effect, right? I mean, in the sense of, you know, in the early days of the pandemic, the, the way supply chains collapsed, 
so you can't just think of these as purely as a healthcare issue, but have people on board who can think about law and order, who can think in terms of supply chains and so on and so forth. And if the, as I said earlier, if that expertise is not available within the government, how do you reach out outside of the government and get the expertise, right? We need to have these mechanisms in place so that everything does not become ad hoc at the time of crisis. Because at the time of crisis, everybody's bandwidth is completely choked. Nobody has the time to actually think through this. People are fatigued, people are tired. So how do you reach out? So these are things that should be put in place ahead of time. So I would argue that you know, some of these things, if we had actually, if we think about it ahead of time and put in process, in place processes ahead of time, I think we'll be able to deal with this a lot better, especially if we are able to think through an interdisciplinary lens and not just confine risk to say healthcare, right? I mean, there's all kinds of risks that are possible. We, in Kerala, we dealt with floods. Now we've dealt with Nipah and COVID. You know, the next thing that comes along may not be either healthcare or natural cat catastrophe. It may be something else altogether. So how does one think about this? I, I, I think that's worth spending a fair bit of time on. And I think organizations like CPPR are best placed to do this kind of work in, in, in Kerala. Thank you, Ruben. It was wonderful uh, listening to you and uh, thank you for your time. I know uh, you, you want to leave at 6.30, so I'll let you go now, <laughs> but I will catch up with you later. Uh, thank you so much. And on behalf of CPP and all the panelists here, I extend a warm regards to you and uh, good work thank done you. by IDFC. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, my next uh, question to, is to uh, uh, Mr. Rajiv Sadanandan. Uh, regarding the leadership, uh, because I, I know that you are part of uh, COVID uh, flat time, then you were there at the administ in the administration during the time of NIPA and all. And a lot of talks, a uh, lot of discussions happening around the world. And in our paper also, we discussed quite a bit about leadership role. How decides your leadership? I'm not only talking about the administrative leader, I mean, the political leadership, it's also about the administrative leadership. Uh, could you give some insights? What are the learnings uh, and these three experiences that we have, like Ruben said, flights, NEPA, now COVID, and what 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 are, what are your insights on this? Um, a couple of uh, days ago, I think uh, I don't know whether it was Ruben's uh, webinar or another webinar that I was addressing. One of the questions that uh, I was uh, asked to comment on was the impact on the health sector. So I thought rather than my taking this uh, question, I'll talk to some of my former colleagues, my officers in the district and so on. I asked them, what is it that, you know, that, um, that, that you remember the most about this uh, COVID epidemic? And frankly, we in Kerala believe that this is, the things are under control in spite of what people talk about us outside. I mean, my, our health system people think that we are winning and we're on the top of, uh, uh, top of the problem. I mean, the, the, the plateau will continue, cases will continue, but uh, our objective of, I mean, I, I, I guess the minister will talk about what our objective was, but we believe our objectives are continuing to be met. The, almost everybody said the biggest take home for them has been the high level of morale with which the system responded. I mean, they were talking about the health system, but I would say the same thing about the whole of the, of the governance here. Even people who were not known to be great, uh, you know, committed and all that stood and fought. And, and my colleagues are extremely proud of the response that we made. Like we fought, we won. So that is a, that's a, that's a crucial thing that we saw on in, in all the crises that we have met here in NEPA, whether it is flood. Uh, during flood, I remember we uh, decided to go in for anticipating a huge epidemic. We decided to go in for an additional, some 900 additional hospitals and uh, field work and so on. The people who were manning these uh, hospitals were having floods in their home, but they were there. They were there. To del and, and I remember on a Wednesday when we had to immunization, our immunization teams are out there. So that was the level of commitment that I mean, irrespective of the badly maligned lower bureaucracy that you talk about in Kerala, that is that is actual leadership. That is the that is the that is what sustains the state, and that is what I believe, irrespective of 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 what 
people allege about our systems that i think is what 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 really works the um, our learning from confronting the ebola epidemic is that transparency I mean, trust is the most important thing that uh, that a government needs in a crisis and trust comes out of transparency now one if you, if you remember a major newspaper carries their uh, statistics saying as reported by government as if they don't even trust what the government is saying whereas in the state uh, we, uh, kerala has a policy of being transparent with the data when the news is bad when the news is good so when people start getting worried about the brick bats they are getting at the national level that kerala is a state with the highest incidence then great so what kerala is also a state that is handling it so the 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 uh, the what we have seen in terms of the leadership during a crisis not only here whether it is congo whether it is anywhere else is the trust that the government has and i've seen that you know kerala has a uh, kerala governments have a high level of trust and that is that's that's again politics neutral you know uh, the 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 the, uh, the 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 politicians uh, are not perceived the way r r r r trusted a, a point that ms nair makes in his uh, in his paper also that the local panchayat president the local mla the local minister even during nepa the the, the Uh, they were there and they were seen to be leading at every level and that i think is something for which very little credit has been given both to the uh, kerala politician and to the kerala bureaucracy thank you sir for that uh, uh, in, uh, for those insights uh, uh, again connecting to that point uh, i have a question from uh, uh, dr tv paul from magil university uh, this goes to dr raghavan uh, uh he, he doctor i'm just reading out what he you know sent me now uh, dr raghavan made a good point there is a fascinating book by amartya sen on comparing india and china in dealing with farmingness he showed mass death in maoist china happened due to the lack of freedom of press so i'm coming to the point of freedom of press and media role of media in this but in daily performance he also have another point one is role of media comparing china and india or in kerala because we our paper also dealt with that subject in detail the other one is about the daily performance chinese bureaucracy has to perform for legitimacy and survival reasons which indian bureaucracy does not seems to worry much this is a comment from top tv paul <laughs> uh, would you like to comment on that <laughs> yeah i I'll, i'll definitely comment on that but before that i'll just touch upon the aspect of weakening of who that uh, is the ruben trust upon uh, in this sure. thing see one of the uh, disappointments if i if i may use that word has been the fact that who could not take a leadership role during the whole pandemic since said it declared a pandemic very date then they had difficulty in going to china as accessing the records and generally the whole uh, approach of who has been popularly seen to be i i don't want to say that it has been but the popular perception is that it has been a bit it has handled china with a lot of kid gloves now china has been dominating international bodies it heads four of the international multilateral bodies and it is now a major donor to most of them so they fund it but the concept of international bodies is that irrespective of who funds it everyone has a right there all nations are, are there and it it is for the treating everyone alike that we have the bodies now we we have had instances where one or one country or the other would have taken leadership and guided in a fashion during crisis but that was strangely lacking now this is one thing which china would do well to remember if it has aspirations for global leadership it should be able to rise above the point that yes if i made a mistake i should accept it up front and say yes mistakes do happen it's not that i don't make mistakes at all accept it and, and then analyze what are the problems and then try to move forward us has been a global leader it has been a global leader. it's not that us hasn't committed mistakes they have committed mistakes but at the same time nobody really challenged it because broadly it was felt that the views represented the views that us carried represented that of most parts of the world or in times of crisis it was a country which most people could look up to and you had to understand that even at the at the peak of cold war during the 1950s USA and USSR could come together to have a fight or to wage a battle against smallpox this sort of cooperation we didn't see between 
USA and China now. One could be the fact that USA was into its own world of isolationism in the, and Trumpism was ruling there. But this is one area where the global leadership area was strangely in a sort of vacuum when the pandemic came in. And that sort of affected the response. If we had uh, the two, the China and USA working together, if China had accepted the offer of Trump at that point to take in experts from USA, probably the whole thing would have played out better. This is just being wiser after the event. But the weakening of international bodies is certainly a cause of huge concern. Now, about the media, the point is well taken because uh, what are the uh, key elements in tackling an epidemic? One is transparency. People should know. And second is sharing of best practices. Now, you have the this thing, you announce that, yes, we have flattened the curve, we, we have survived the whole thing, and then say, this is our method, we can all have it in the other parts of the world, it's not going to work out, especially when people think that you, it has emanated from you and it has spread because you have not handled the crisis within yourself very well. So it is here that the role of an independent media comes in. The role of an independent observers who go as independent observers, study the issue and report on it. Whatever comes out, as uh, Rajiv sir was saying, as reported by the government, well, when you say it is as reported by the Chinese media, because it is the Chinese media that says it, independent observers are not allowed in, uh, and whosoever goes in has generally come back with a report which sort of whitewashes the whole uh, uh, affair. That's the impression that people get. So the role of independent media becomes very important in times of crisis like this, because correct information has to reach the people concerned. And if I mistakes are there, they should be... Sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought you uh, so, uh, stopped. Mistakes have to be uh, mistakes have to be acknowledged. So, if China wants to be a leader, it has to accept that leaders show the qualities of humility, benevolence, and magnanimity. This should be understood. Then only can it aspire to global leadership in in a manner which is becoming of its great uh, tradition and the brilliant civilizational uh, prestige that it brings with it. Thank you. So uh, uh, probably I, I'll take uh, our, our next question from the participants again to Dr. Raghavan. It's about the international liberal order. You know, now the pandemic changed. The pandemic challenged the international liberal order that is existing that was existing for the last many decades. Uh, what do you see as a future now? I mean, since you are also an expert in the international relations, what do you see? What are the learnings? Because it is a time, as you said, we were experting in collective action, multilateralism. But now um, uh, things are going the opposite direction, I would say. Uh, so uh, uh, do you think the COVID uh, situation is going to change the global order or we are going to see a total shakeup in the system? Global because order this is... This is uh, sorry, to add that, you know, the context is the vaccination because there is a vaccine uh, you know, competition also going on who is having more vaccines, who is having the doses, more doses, who is manufacturing it, who has got the money to buy them and stock them and all. So in that context, I'm not getting the political context as such, but in this context, health context. In, in that context also, if you look at it, one way in which China tried to recover from the, uh, or, or to regain the credibility was what was called as a mask diplomacy, in which they supplied masks and other equipments and also gave financial aid to countries who they, generally they considered would be on their side. But it wasn't such a great success. All said and then uh, it met with a lot of criticism. People accepted masks and other things, but it did not win them the brownie points that they probably would have expected. And it did not bring down the credibility gap that uh, uh, caused it. Similarly, on the issue of vaccines also, yes, presently there is a run for the whole this thing. And it, it's still very early days so far as vaccines are concerned. So, uh, and anyway, we, we all know that this has been a time of great emergency. There's a rush to prepare the vaccine, not just for XOY, but for the entire humanity. You need a vaccine for life to get back to normal. And vaccine is also a huge confidence booster. You think that, yes, you're turn, turning the turning around the corner to better days ahead. So it's a huge boost, uh, morale booster on that. But yes, vaccine diplomacy and using vaccine to increase the your reach, your clout, will certainly be one of the steps that countries should try in the, this thing. Because Especially because there are only very few countries that have this. And this will be used for pushing their national interest. But one has to understand that that will not be a permanent solution. Because we are supplying vaccines for some time, doesn't mean that you, you will go up in the credibility list for too long. International relations are governed by multiple factors. And you, you, we can just see COVID had 
got its first important or, or major casualty right in USA. You, you can see the development is there. But for COVID, if you, if you can read some of the uh, books that are published in USA by eminent authors, you find that the present president, he is president till 20th of January, uh, was sitting pretty before the COVID crisis hit USA. And then the whole thing changed. Maybe uh, that's a, we, we will see a returning and there will also be a rethinking because in international relations, uh, economic might, military might, all these things certainly do come in. So that, that will certainly be there. But probably the mindset of the people, the mindset of the leaders might also undergo a change and work towards some areas of cooperation. Let's think about environment. Let's think about various other areas for the survival of humanity, the areas where they should come together. As I said earlier, the cooperation that happened at the peak of Cold War between two superpowers in tackling a disease might be a sort of uh, example that could be emulated. So we will see a change in the manner in which countries deal with themselves, if not necessarily in the pecking order in the international order. That's what I would foresee on it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, next question is to Rajiv, sir. Uh, sir, uh, there is a question on the welfare schemes announced. Uh, you're a public healthcare expert. How much it matters? Because we see in this, you know, a very ignominious pictures of migrant labor, walking. I mean, I'm generally talking about India, but in Kerala also there were scenes, uh, unruly scenes, uh, and government tried to manage the show. So in these situation, in situations like these, how these welfare schemes, support system, the local support system, communities, how they they should work together, and what can we learn from them? Because our paper also talked about it. What way we could, some of the things should be institutionalized, some of them should be strengthened and empowered. What are the lessons from this pandemic? Well, there are, uh, this I think should be approached at two levels. One is an immediate intervention to prevent starvation, you know, uh, ensure that people are not put to hardship and so on. So, so that I think is something that Kerala did reasonably well. But the impact on the economy, you know, lives have been ruined businesses built over years have been ruined now that is where when we that is where we need to appreciate the way china tried to put their economy back in business uh, march 3rd i was in a in a in a, in a workshop in uh, in mumbai with the chinese consul and his his entire refrain was that we need to get come on you guys renew your orders and we need to get back to work because they realized that while immediate uh, immediate uh, solution like giving food etc would be of use the getting the business back is something that that unless you do it has long term consequences like not getting your schools back to work not getting your business back is is all going to be a uh, is, is 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 will have long term consequence i worry that kerala has taken that hit and I'm not sure how long it's going to be before the economy can get back to what it was and I'm not talking about the large macro economy I'm talking about individual businesses uh, and so on now uh, which is an area well like when you look at the uh, US uh, stimulus package while they are giving a, a certain amount to people for their immediate support they're also supporting, you know, uh, uh, businesses to, 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 to come back. Uh, I think that is something that not only Kerala, but the whole of India has not reconfigured. How is it that we will help our businesses get back into uh, full life? And how is it that, you know, we will bring the economy back? And I think, I, frankly, I, I, I don't think we have a roadmap for it. So could you also give some insights on this? Uh, there's a question uh, from Dr. Tatagata Chatterjee uh, asking, uh, can there be some discussions about coordination between Kerala state government and local governments? I would, I would also like to know the coordination between Kerala government and the union government. Um, not from a political context, but in terms of, you know, the, the, we talked about federalism in this context uh, and also the paper we discussed a little bit about Indian democratic systems and institutional mechanisms and how Chinese, you know, the, from the central leadership to the local, you know, how they actually not instructed, they just commanded things to happen. 
Uh, so what are the lessons that could be learned from this process of decentralization? Also the centralization. I would say centralization versus decentralization. You have hardly half an hour left. And each <laughs> of these topics is going to take a two hour. <laughs> Let me briefly cover. In fact, this question was raised to me uh, by the uh, government of Andhra Pradesh. Do we have a documentation on how is it that Kerala, you know, uh, has, uh, uh, Kerala has involved the uh, how, how is it Kerala has decentralized health? In fact, when we looked at it, we found that it has never been properly documented. Uh, my organization has just commissioned a study, which uh, hopefully should produce the, uh, the, 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 the document that uh, Dr. Chatterjee can possibly uh, look at. But uh, important thing is, after the 73rd and 74th Amendment, uh, which transferred public health to the local uh, panchayats and municipalities, in 1996, Kerala transferred the control of all institutions other than teaching hospitals and some general hospitals to the Gram Panchayat, Block Panchayat, District and Municipalities. So right now, the entire health infrastructure is administratively under the local, uh, lo local governments. Uh, uh, and, and this is not only in, in, uh, on paper, uh, because of the flexible funding that the uh, Gram Panchayats have, they invest actively in, uh, in the, these institutions. If you look at the Andhram project and the family health centers that the government of Kerala has pushed, almost all of those 550 you know, or more, now it may, must be much more, FSCs that have been started have been set up with the support of uh, local bodies. Many of the staff are governed by the local bodies. The Village Health and Nutrition uh, and Sanitation Committee, as we call it, which is an organization of NHM, is led by the local ward member. <clears throat> After the 2018 flood, uh, disaster management is also decentralized to the, uh, to, to the, to the panchayat levels. So there are ward level, uh, 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 ward level disaster management committees. So the both in terms of administrative reconfiguration and in terms of financial allocation, the uh, local governments in Kerala have been empowered and charged with responding to, uh, the, uh, to, to any disaster, including health disasters. Those of you who have tracked this, the response of Kerala during the pandemic would have realized that the Gram Panjayat members practically hardly slept those days. You know, they were out in the field organizing community kitchens, Trying to find, uh, uh, trying to find uh, migrant workers, take care of them because partly because the panchayat they knew the panchayat election was due to come, and if they are not seen to be active, they will not uh, uh, do well. But also, every by now every local government member and uh, president have realized that in Kerala, unless you do well on health, coming back to power is something that is beyond you. Uh, that and and consider the fact they have money. Concerned the fact that the uh, structure has been uh, uh, created to support them, uh, we will be seeing increased you know, uh, ownership by uh, panchayats, especially gram panchayats. Now, center state is a huge topic, and if something which <laughs> will be very difficult to cover in this small period, but uh, health is a state subject. In the in the uh, in the union um, in, 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 the, in the constitution of India, but control of epidemics between states falls within the union list. The federal fiscal relations are so skewed in favor of the central government, especially with the GST that has come. Practically, entire huge money power, especially on a state like Kerala, is with the central government. Uh, now, uh, Advocate Prashant Bhushan has argued that the uh, government of India did not have the right to introduce a central lockdown and states should have, should have, uh, should have neglected it. And, and there's no way it could have been enforced uh, under the constitution of India. But what he forgot and what every chief minister and finance minister knows is that the financial uh, power is with the central government. So he who pays the piper calls the tune. So even though the uh, health is a state subject, since no government would want to forgo the amount of money that is released under NHM, the central is able to call shots, which are far beyond what the scheme envisages. Having said that, one 
uh, when I look at the response of different states, I find that states have innovated like anything. Some of the states that we didn't expect to do well have done very well. And these are local initiatives that have come up. But overall, the central government got to call the shots. It had a good, uh, it had some beneficial effects because the whole vaccine is being funded by them. The huge impact that took place on uh, during the lockdown, the uh, number of uh, units that were created to create ventilators, PPEs, drugs, or not, would not have been possible for the state government. So I think uh, by and large, while the legal boundaries of, you know, uh, of, of what, who should have done what might be a little blurred, the realities of federal fiscal you know, relationship and the, uh, and the fact that the central government could uh, summon resources that are beyond the capacity of the state ensured that the central government got a, a highly centralizing role in this whole business. I know that's not a very satisfactory answer, but that's the best I can do under the second. I do understand, sir. I do understand. Uh, so, uh, so there is one other question on uh, the uh, because there are 2017-18 we have this in parliament. There is a bill to institute private health care in India, and 2009 there was another bill. Uh, do you think there is a time for us to introduce a dedicated health care like Indian administrative service? Uh, whereas I think the understanding by and large uh, when I was doing the research is. Uh, most of the times people think that it's only doctors and nurses, you know, they form the healthcare uh, institution mechanism. We are not talking about the social workers, we are not talking about uh, other stakeholders in the business. Uh, so could you give some insights, you know, from all this experience and also the emerging situations that we have? Uh, what is the way out? I mean, should we go, should, what are, because tomorrow Kerala budget is, you know, <laughs> presented. Uh, uh, first of February, central budget, union budget is announced, and uh, people are expecting a lot on uh, you know, investment in healthcare, healthcare provisions, institutional infrastructure investments, and all. What is your advice? What is your learning, and what is your advice? I must say, I'm slightly biased being a member of the Indian Administrative Service. It will be difficult for me to oppose uh, a, a central card, but I would still oppose it because. The health is such locally contextualized and nuanced that uh, uh, I would say there's no rationale for uh, an all India medical service. But there is certainly a rationale for, uh, for reconfiguring the health systems of uh, health carders of states. For example, one question you should have asked is, why is it that Kerala does not have a dedicated public health carder like uh, Tamil Nadu has or uh, Maharashtra has? So, those are systemic changes that we need to do, but I don't believe the there is a rationale for uh, for an all India you know uh, structure because I, I work in Kerala now I work with uh, different uh, with, with other states the situation is very very different and and um, uh, uh, while it'd be good for people to have a cross learning I do not know whether uh, whether a uh, all India structure would be useful. In the health sector, unlike in, let's say, Dr. Akhavan's service or, 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 or uh, other, serv other services. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, Raghavan sir, I have uh, this question from uh, one of the participants. Uh, uh, so only China showing some growth now in economy. China is the only country which shows positive GDP growth uh, because they, I mean, we believe that they contain the virus that actually helped them to come out of this economic recession. And in fact, they're also uh, you know, driving the global economy now. So uh, in India, a lot of, uh, I, I, I've listened and interacted with many economies. They say like, you know, we could have done this, we could have done that. You know, whether we are going to have U-shape or V-shape or, you know, staggered growth rate, a staggered growth now, uh, revival, how that is going to happen. Uh, but somebody is ask, asking here, uh, even though all the recession talks are going on, our sensors and all the indices are doing well. <laughs> so what is the connect there? And uh, you know, how the economy and the health emergency situation could be tackled in a better way that you know, economy, I mean, the economic crisis could be averted. So, uh, on the issue of Sensex, see, basically there has been more money in circulation. One is the uh, interest rates have come down. There have been uh, a lot of schemes had been announced for uh, tax rebates had been announced, tax incentives are announced, schemes for MSMEs are announced. So there has been more money in circulation. So that ultimately finds its way to the stock markets. 
So lot, uh, uh, not entirely, but substantial portion of that happens. So you find that there is always a correlation between low interest rates and a rise in the stock market. This always happens. So that is that can be the prime reason for that. No, we we still uh, are officially with two quarters when we had a uh, negative growth officially puts us under the category of being in recession as per the definition of that word. So uh, things are not yet, we are not out of the woods as asset. But that being so, there, there are signs that things might be turning around. There are some sectors where the effect of lockdown has been much more. We, we can see around us, the tourism industry has taken a huge hit. There are certain other sectors which have taken a huge hit. But there are some sectors which have done well also. We, we should not forget that. Automobile industry ha had a bad year in 2019-20. They are doing well. Tire is doing well. Consequently, the sector which I am looking after now, rubber, has been having a better year compared to what it was last year. The prices are higher. So it, it has had, the impact is felt in different ways in, in the various sectors. But still, we are still in a recession. And how will we get out? I, I suppose a vaccine would be the thing that would change it. Because finally, the conference comes in. That, that's the whole this thing. Vaccine is in one way, it protects people. But con uh, vaccine is also a huge confidence booster, morale booster that, yes, we have gained upper hand over the virus. So this is a confidence booster that can come around it. Now, uh, we, we, we can have endless debate over the impact of the stimuli that has been given. Uh, sir, uh, I'm, very, I'm a little bit specific here about the Chinese economy. because in China uh, Okay, sorry, about the Chinese, Chinese economy. Again, uh, we go by the figures that, that, that they give us. But China has... Let, let, let us again put in. What, what has China been doing all these years? China has been exporting. So it, it is uh, countries may be wary of the supply chain, may be, uh, avoid on this over-reliance on one country, but they will not be able to shift out immediately because so much has been sunk into China. So that activity would still continue. And by Chinese listing, the impact of the uh, pandemic had been largely controlled to couple of provinces or maybe basically in one province and it, the impact was not felt throughout the country unlike in India where the impact was felt throughout the country. So even though a lot of uh, disruptions have happened world over, the output from Chinese factories would still continue because that is required by the rest of the world. One. Two, they have projects in various parts of the world in the form of the BRI. Even though they are in a state of slowdown or maybe even stagnation, the projects are still there. So that offers another uh, channel for Ch uh, Chinese goods, Chinese workers, and uh, uh, for, for being utilized and, and the pro production taking place. Third, they have used all the medical equipment, uh, the supporting systems like masks, PPE kits, and even the vaccine. That also has happened. So with all this, China was a country which is best suited to emerge out of the recession or, or rather the setback fast, given the realities. But we had to take into consideration one important aspect. One, would all countries or all companies or the business establishment continue to place their entire reliance on China? One. Two, will the global supply chain be what it was before the pandemic? As it is, uh, disruptions have thrown a lot of things out of gear. A lot of companies have announced that while they will not wind up their operations in China, they would not be expanding that on that and would locate their new plans in other parts of the world. As it is, US is trying to encourage people to set up closer to their uh, closer to their country. So all these changes can happen, which would affect China adversely. So even if they can claim to have come out of recession and claim that the economy is doing better, in the long run, the pandemic would cost China much more in terms of financial and economic load than what they feel right now. This is what I feel. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, we have to conclude uh, this event. Uh, actually, I was uh, my team is in touch with the minister's office. She's still in a meeting, uh, important meeting. So, uh, yeah, sir, I, 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 I hand it over to Taragan, sir, to uh, make some remarks. And uh, probably we can conclude the session by releasing the paper by you, sir. Sir, you're on mute. Okay, uh, I think it has been a delightful conversation.
although we are all a bit disappointed that the Honorable Minister could not join us. I'm sure that her good wishes are with us and uh, the team which undertook this study of comparing what happened in Kerala and in the Hubei province over the first three or four months of the epidemic can be uh, proud of the fact that uh, the very fact that the Honorable Minister agreed to release the study itself is a recognition of the importance of their endeavor and enterprise. And this is no ordinary minister. When uh, we usually refer to ministers as honorable, but this lady has earned the epithet not merely because she is a minister, but because of the dedication and commitment that she uh, brought to the job, which has been acknowledged the world over. Sometimes I think that the word teacher has become a Malayalam word now. You know, in the United Kingdom, they refer to a lady of noble birth or accomplishment as lady. But here, we refer to a lady who's done noble deeds as teacher. And when we refer to the Honorable Minister Shailen, the teacher, I think there's a great deal of affection, appreciation, and admiration for what she has done. <clears throat> CPPR's humble effort to make a comparative study of Hubei and Kerala in the context of the pandemic is at least in part a complement to the stellar role that the minister and the healthcare workers of Kerala played in holding this global threat at bay for over three months. As a former policeman, I'm also proud of the significant contribution that the police in Canada and elsewhere in India made in this epic fight against COVID-19. My encomiums to Sri Murli Tharanaya and the CPPR team consisting of Sri Madhu Shivaraman Ms. Nishi Solomon, Ms. Angela Cecilia Joseph, and Dr. Dhanraj, who, with able support from Sherilyn, Aravind, and Ritika, produced this unique study, which I hope scholars, policymakers, and all those who have been touched in any way by this pandemic would find useful, at least in small ways. This may well be a small contribution uh, to the voluminous literature that the pandemic has already produced, but the authors are entitled to be proud of their work, all the more so because a group of eminent panelists who took part in the discussions today have based their discussions on this uh, deep, and probing study that we have conducted uh, in a limited period against uh, overwhelming odds. The conversation itself was so, uh, covered such a vast area, space, and subject that I'm not even trying to summarize it as, a, uh, as one is expected to do in the concluding remark. Because the, 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 the extent of the experience, the width and the vision of the three panelists were reflected in every response to every question which were masterfully, masterfully uh, uh, passed on to them by the, by the moderator, as well as the questions uh, which were all uh, extremely interesting. There were questions on the bureaucracy, um, database and making use of expert advice from outside government. And uh, interestingly, uh, Mr. Robin Abraham's assertion that Kerala was actually concerned 
about protection of user data was an interesting assertion in view of the controversies that had arisen in that context. About global order, Dr. Raghun was very articulate about uh, his uh, perception that in the long run, the Chinese economy would also be affected because of the pandemic, despite the, the, the fact that they're ahead of the rest of the pack at the moment. Uh, Mr. Rajesh Sadanandan, with his vast experience and expertise, spoke about various aspects of health administration and also about decentralization and about how local self government in Kerala played a very major role in combating the, the, uh, the pandemic. To my mind, uh, the pandemic is actually a national security threat uh, because national security is actually the uh, aggregate of the sense of security of each and every person in this country, plus the security of the common assets of the country, the common wealth of the country. If you go by that calculation, uh, the attempt to maximize national security would mean that we must, that our first objective must be to raise everyone in this country above the poverty level. And anything that slows down our effort to do that must be considered a national security threat. And it is evident that pandemic would very clearly do so. And therefore, apart from everything else, the pandemic has also to be seen as a national security threat. I would conclude by saying that while somebody then I would especially like to make a mention of the work that he has put in despite many personal problems, uh, he is, uh, we had the, had the good fortune of working with him and I know what a hard worker he is. Uh, he's put in a great deal of effort supported by his team and uh, uh, he has concluded this study. This study has covered from the beginning of the pandemic to the time when both Hubei and Kerala had achieved a zero uh, level of reporting of cases on a daily basis. But thereafter, there has been a spike in Kerala, whereas in China, they managed to keep the, uh, the, the pandemic under control. And how they have done it and wh why we were not able to do that is worth another study, which I shall not impose on <laughs> Mr. Murali Dharan, but I suppose uh, somebody is not CPPR, some other uh, interested parties could take up the study. I think we need to see how, uh, how that came about. I do not think it is because of any uh, slack on the part of, uh, of Kerala government or healthcare workers, uh, but whether there's any policy direction uh, which could have been different is something that we need to be seen. One aspect which strikes me is that while healthcare workers have to be in the lead, they're the best place to lead this campaign against the pandemic. The enforcement could perhaps be, uh, you know, uh, uh, given that task could be given more to the enforcement agency, like the police, uh, not because they're smarter or, uh, or competent, but that the task for which they've been trained. And therefore, the, the enforcement could have been done better if the police were uh, continued to be uh, involved uh, in, a, in a major role, even after the first few months is something that we need to look at. Then, also, we need to look at some interesting things like non-spread of the epidemic among the agitating farmers in Delhi, in spite of the fact that they're all staying together and eating together and all that. So that is something that we need to study. And in this connection, and this is my concluding point, uh, Dr. Zanadraj, uh, the fact that in my village, it's called Olawai, small village, surrounded on three sides by backwaters, we have a population of, I don't know, 
between 1,000 to 2,000. But we have had only 10 cases with one mortality during all these months. And despite the fact that many youngsters from here go to Cochin to work on a daily basis. I would like to somewhat to study this to see whether there are any lessons to be learned from this. Whether the fact that it is not a very crowded village uh, has contributed to this uh, is something that we need to study. I would conclude here because we are really overshot the timing and uh, I'm very happy to see that CPPR organized this function in such a in a good manner to the participation of the eminent uh, panelists and the participation of so many other interested, uh, distinguished participants whose names I've been seeing as they popped up on the chat. Thank you very much once again. Uh, I would like to show the cover page of the report and I wish sir, uh, you to announce that the report is released and this is uh, the link of the uh, report is given in the chat box and everybody participating in this, uh, this program, they will get the link and they can download the uh, paper from the website and also there is a permanent link that is given on the home page of CPPA website now. Thank you. Uh, Hello. Uh, with that, uh, we are, uh, sir, are you, hello? Sir, you are on mute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. I am uh, greatly honored and a great pleasure in uh, releasing this study report on uh, the COVID 19 pandemic and how it was dealt with in Dubai province of China and Kerala state of India. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. With that, we are uh, coming to the end of the program. Um, I take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, all the panelists. Uh, Ruben Abraham, uh, he joined from Switzerland. Uh, and he had another meeting, but uh, uh, he said it's my, his pleasure to join this program and contribute and share and learn from this uh, uh, panel. Uh, I also thank uh, Dr. Ken Raghavan, IRS, always a well-wisher and a good friend, great friend of CPPR. Thank you, sir, for joining us uh, uh, in the evening. And I also thank uh, Rajiv Sudhanandan. Uh, 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 he, in fact, uh, I talked to him. Um, I, I, he helped, helped CPPR in one of our earlier health studies when he was in service. Uh, so I always found him very uh, insightful. Uh, learned a lot from him today also. Thank you, sir. And uh, minister could not join uh, because I'm told that there was an emergency meeting chaired by chief minister now, uh, still uh, going on. Uh, minister's office informed us in between few times that she would be able to join. Uh, but now uh, we decided that uh, she probably would send us a message uh, on, this, uh, on this paper later on. So thank you for all of your participation. Uh, thank you for your uh, support. And I would also like to announce uh, another event related to COVID-19. We'll be hosting a book discussion uh, on COVID-19, a book authored by three doctors, uh, Dr. Randeep Guleria, Dr. Gangadeep Khan, and Dr. Chandrakant Laharia. The book name is Till We Win, uh, published by Penkin Books. All the others agreed to be, uh, uh, agreed to join for a conversation. Uh, it will happen next uh, in, in the next fortnight uh, because many of them are busy with the vaccination and they're part of the institution support that is provided to the government of India and to the various state governments. So I wish all of you could join that program. We'll let you know in advance. We'll send you the invite. Now we will also send you the paper, uh, all the those participate in this. Program. I also thank uh, Paragon sir and uh, Murli Dhan sir for your support, guidance, uh, and uh, mentoring that you are giving to the team all these years. And uh, I also congratulate uh, the key members who uh, organize the event, and especially my colleagues who co-authored this paper. Thank you so much, and uh, wish you a very wonderful, great evening. Thank you. Good night.